back to all of it. Good set of time. I have, um, well, the uh, board chair's announcement to make. One of our elected members, uh, Councillor Denise really has um, become unwell. I think she's found the evening stressful, as everybody has, let's be frankly honest, um, and has taken on well. So for, for the minutes, it doesn't have to be recorded that Councillor really has uh, left the meeting and, and will take no further part in, in the uh, decision making. Okay, um, with, with that said, um, we now move on to the uh, next set of witnesses, and these are evidence from the um, people, obviously officers are part of the authority. Uh, Julia Hassel, the Director of Children's Services, David Armstrong, who is Assistant Chief Executive and Head of Universal Infrastructure Services, and Andrew Roberts, who is Head of Branch and Planning Resources. Um, th they have up to five minutes to speak to us. Uh, for uh, brevity, they, they are not taking that option and will probably be spending more time answering questions from, from elected members. But Julia, you want to give us the background uh, and the thought process that end up in the presentation of the papers to Cabinet and the consequent decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you Chair and uh, members and members of the audience. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, um, from a, a senior officer perspective, um, how much I appreciated hearing what the, the parents and members of staff said this evening. Um, I think following that, uh, what the three of us will say will sound a bit bureaucratic, a bit clinical, um, and it, it's by virtue of the, the proposals that we need to put forward. Um, I would like to state that all three of us come from the position of, of valuing the children that we work with and, and regarding outcomes for children as an absolute priority. Um, the report that was presented to Cabinet on the 16th of January uh, was seeking approval to consult on the closure of the Lindale School. Um, and the report set out the background, uh, saying that local authorities have a statutory duty to make sure there are sufficient places uh, in their area with fair access to educational opportunity uh, to promote every child's potential. The reasons why in the report we were considering the closure of the school um, is because of the viability of the school was compromised because of its small size and poor enrollment. Uh, which both contribute to a difficult financial position. And I think, as you said, Chair, earlier, um, this is not in any way because of the standard of care and education within the school, uh, which is good and in many aspects outstanding. Um, in terms of the falling role over the last seven years, the Lindale School's average occupancy has been 59%. Um, and there are currently 23 children at the school out of a total possible 40 places. Um, I know the second report that you're considering calling uh, really um, focuses on the financial position. But just very briefly, um, the size of the school and the numbers of pupils contribute to a difficult financial position with a likely deficit of 72,000 without corrective action in 14-15 and the potential for this to increase, increase to be in excess of 232,000, based on the numbers of children currently on the school roll. And part of that is because of changes to the national formula, which Councillor Smith referred to, in terms of funding individual places occupied, um, and a reduction from 40 funded places to 23, because there are 23 children in the places. And also applying the new banded top-up system. Should a decision be taken um, to close, and this would be in the future, I need to keep emphasising that the report that went to Cabinet on the 16th of January was seeking permission to consult on the potential uh, closure. And the report on the 16th of January said that at this stage, um, the, two most, uh, the most viable option, if and should the school close, uh, was to expand Ellery Park School and Stanley Schools uh, so, so that um, the children currently at Lindale School and future children uh, would go to both of those schools. Um, it, it certainly would simply not be a case of just adding children into the existing schools, but would require very, very careful planning, consultation. 
innovation and change the very nature of each school uh, by virtue of additional children joining that school, both schools community. It's really important to say that in the most recent Ofsted report, Elmley Park School was judged to be outstanding across the board, and Stanley School was judged to be a good school with outstanding leadership and management. One thing I did want to say, and it responds to possibly some of the points made earlier, it's really important to state at this stage uh, that the closure of the school appears the most viable option after having considered a number of options, which are the eight options that, that parents refer to. However, I, I have said and I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that the eight options have been considered by local authority officers, and I would expect if we proceed to consultation that each of those options will be rigorously considered again, and there will be other options that come forward that we have not thought of. So it will very genuinely be an op a, a proper options appraisal, looking at each and every option that comes forward. Should Cabinet, um, the, the report that went to the 16th actually talks about the next steps. So should Cabinet agree to uh, consult on whether we should close the school, they would then follow a 12 week consultation process that would involve uh, full consultation meetings, uh, consultation meeting with the parents, teachers, interested people connected with Lindale School, with Stanley School, with Elmwood Park School, with the drop-in sessions, we'd do whatever we needed to do to get to the, the best possible option to move forward. I think in summary, I would want to conclude just by describing the report that went on the 16th of January, is that by saying considering the closure of the school is, is difficult and distressing, as, as you've, you've heard this evening, particularly when children have such special needs and vulnerabilities. It's really important that their needs are placed at the centre of our concern, and that what's called the special education needs improvement test is applied with absolute rigour. And that's a test to make sure that whatever we come up with and whatever cabinet may agree in the future um, is as good as or better than the current provision that the children receive. And um, it was on that basis, taking all those points into account, <coughs> that I recommended to cabinet on the 16th of January uh, that they should agree to consult on the closure and that I proceeded to compile a consultation document. Very happy to answer any questions that members may have or colleagues. Any of you have options to make a statement of views on that? Okay, so it's really open to. I'm sorry, I'll use my mic to apologise. Um, it's, it's obviously open to questions from members. I've got Moira, Leah, and Alan, and I'll take another three out of them. If it's all right with you, Chair, I'll combine two of my questions in one go and make it a bit simpler. First one is, um, there's a capacity for 40 children per day, and there's 23 there currently. Has that reduction so far, um, I mean, I, I don't quite have to put this, Steve did allude to it before, if there's fewer children there, I imagine the establishment has reduced to accommodate for those fewer children, or has the, has the establishment, the establishment I'm talking about, not changed, even though the numbers have reduced? What, uh, uh, the, the establishment has reduced, I think it was two years ago, as, as, as the, the, the funding for places reduced from 45 to 40. Right. And over a period of time, if the numbers have reduced further, what would what happen then? It, a sort of attrition of the population? How would that be dealt with? That's, that's, that's part, of, part of our ongoing discussions with the school um, about, about how the, the, the budget issue mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first one. Um, the, the second one is, I mean, a couple of questions I asked about um, from Zoe and um, and Rochelle were about confidence in the in the process at this point. I think certainly I was dismayed to see the phrasing of, of this report that it was a consultation on closure, and it, it seemed to me in the first instance that um, it, it kind of preempts the outcome. And I have been reassured by a cabinet member. Well, I heard what a cabinet member said. The more reassured that, um, that this is a genuine open consultation and the options 
such that their age of them will be considered and the possibility is still there that other options that haven't been considered to this point may emerge during the process. Does that, <coughs> um, I mean, if you can reassure me or do your best to reassure me that what the second part is, how are you going to reassure parents now because they've lost a bit of confidence in the work, lost a lot of confidence in the process? Okay. Um, by way of reassurance that we will um, have a very full and open and transparent consultation. I'll just uh, take a step back. Take a step back. The advice I sought um, prior to embarking on this process was the local authority in these circumstances where we were considering the viability of the school would put forward a proposal to consult on closure. That is, that is what is done, that is how it's approached. The intention is to consider every single option that, A, that's in the appendix, so the eight <coughs> options that are included there. When I met with the parents prior to Christmas in a pre-consultation meeting, I was explaining how we'd reach the conclusion with a purely internal local authority looking at a number of options, which was about us reaching first base to present a report to Cabinet saying we needed to consult. The consultation will take account of each and every one of those options which we will undertake to revisit again and we will genuinely consider every single option that appears that we may not have considered so <coughs> far. Yeah, just to add to that, just for the benefit of the audience, I'm David Armstrong and I'm Robert is sitting to my left. Just for the benefit of members, I currently have some duties outside of the department, particularly to do with assets and supporting the chief exec. I'm here as the head of service in the children's department. Clearly, I have responsibility around the school budgets and assets and other issues. And obviously, I've known worked here for 24 years and know uh, quite a bit about the school and run that, so it should be clear that that's what I do. I think that, that the comments about the language are very fair, and that people said the same thing to us when we did the five year primary review, because we have to follow um, national documentation and national procedures. If we used sort of a more informal process to begin with, a more informal language, and then it changed to a very formal process partly through people who have some justification to say, well, we did that to, to, to small smoke mirrors and Mr. Woods or whatever. The language is very cold. The only thing I can say to people is that it clearly, if you look at the primary track record of when we did a very, very lengthy and repetitive process of the primary review, we brought forward proposals like this and they named still for closure. And if you look at what we proposed over that period, and if you look at the primary school landscape now, the two don't match. Because sometimes our proposals were accepted after the consultation period, sometimes we told them to go away and start again. And indeed, there's some schools, I can think of one school where we proposed closure twice in two successive cycles, and the school is still there and functioning normally. So I hope, I know it's difficult for people to believe us, I know the language is very cold, but I think the proof is there. <coughs> the process did work was consultation and the outcome was not predetermined, the outcomes were very many and varied. At the end of the day we went from 100 schools to 90, but it was a very different 10 schools to the ones that were called. Alan, and then from the Thanks, Chair. Um, the, the sort of sustainability of, of, uh, of Lindale School has been in question for some time as a, as a thing. We've, we've heard tonight. Am I right? And I, I accept what the, the chair says. Do we want to stray into the, the, the next part of the calling? But I mean, is it the change in the uh, education funding agencies' funding arrangements that has actually prompted us into now looking at the, the school and looking at its viability, or would we have done it anyway? I think it's, it's a, I think it's a key issue in the debate. If, if you take a very briefly, local management of schools began in 1990 when massive big council budgets were broken up and delegated to schools quite rightly, and power was given to schools to spend that money. And, and 
to the ice cream scheme or that started. The, the, the primary and secondary debate puts the money through a formula into the schools. And what's happened over the years, when we first started, we had hundreds of funding factors. So some authorities, we didn't, had a factor that if you had trees on your site, you got more money through the formula. Or if you had a bigger, we had one for a long time where if you had a big building, you got more money. And what's happened in primary and secondary mainstream is that the whole thing over the 20 odd years has been streamlined down, streamlined down, streamlined down. We now have very few factors which are reliant upon deprivation with primarily pupil numbers. If you've got somebody sitting on the seat, you get the money, and if you haven't got somebody sitting on the seat, you don't. And there's a, there's a, there's a check mechanism for being the funding guarantee, but that's, that's the hard reality. What's happened for many years is the special schools sat alongside that. They have a defined budget, a fixed budget, but you are allowed to carry on funding by place rather than pupil. And what's happened is, as, as local management of schools has matured, and it's not a criticism of the system, it's, it's where it was always going to end up over a long journey for 25 years. The, the national changes bring the special sector into line. Not quite the same, but they bring them into line with the primary and secondary situation. Hence this talk of place plus. So for the first time, you can't fund all of it on the place. You have to fund a substantial part of it on the people. And what Andrew and I have never saw is that through the work, through the work of the secondary of the special heads, which is a tight knit family of eleven, through Pat's work, through Andrew's work, that family has agreed for some time now that they will fund from that fixed fund, they will fund forty places, even though there are twenty three children there. And clearly they do that at the expense of money that wouldn't otherwise go through the fund, go through the fund through the schools. And what we're nervous of is, is that a sustainable long term position? We're also nervous that we've been able to decide that locally. Andrew's been able to take reports to the schools forum. Pat's been able to meet with me with the heads. Andrew's met with the heads, met with the governors, and it's all been okay. From next year, we will have to seek an approval from the Education Funding Agency to fund those places. That made Andrew and I particularly nervous because we've had some experience in the National Education Funding Agency where it appeared that when we, when we had a problem, the rules matter more than the children. We were happy to meet with the EFA local officer this week who said that he thought they would be mindful. It was the kind of thing they would agree to. But what we can see is a local arrangement that we think it would be some sort of dereliction of our duties if we didn't say, we don't think this is sustainable in the long term. And we have a changing national picture, which for all the right reasons, as other well as matures, is changing that landscape taking away some of the freedoms we've got. So in that context, yes, it is a key issue. Because it's just a, a little major, just to uh, um, sort of pick up on that. The, uh, I, I fully appreciate the sort of direction of travel and, 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 and where, where we're going. Um, but ultimately, I would like to think that we're making this decision because we've looked at it and we've decided that this is, because ultimately we are responsible for public funds, that this is the, the right thing to do. <coughs> Almost regardless of what the, the, uh, the funding arrangements have, are suggesting. Um, because uh, when I read the report, it, it looks as though it's all driven by the funding arrangements and not by the... Um, by the, the my question is this. Really staying into the next call. Right? Mm -hmm. I know I am staying into this, but it just, because it I, I do think it's at the end, it's fundamental to <coughs> the whole process. I just, what I really wanted, my question is this. Lindale School is something special. We've heard that tonight. Would we as a council put a price on that specialness? <coughs> So yeah, it is a very special school. 
but th this is where we appear, and this is where we have a very difficult job to do. Do we just sit on our hands and say nothing and know that an informal arrangement that has worked well for a few years hasn't got the resilience to carry on? Or do we come to you and do we say to the director, actually, the landscape's changing nationally, the numbers aren't rising, we're funding this place with empty places, currently the other schools are compliant with that, but it's a tight-knit family of heads that hasn't had a lot of change. We have to come and put the issue on the table and say, this is where it is. This is nothing to do with the specialness of the school. The school is a very special place, and we've all played a part in, in our little way, a very little way compared to what we've heard tonight, in making it what it is. Sorry, um, bring in Leah Fraser. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I've got um, two questions for Julia Hassel and two for David Armstrong, but I don't mind who answers them. Is that okay to ask all four? Right, I'll ask them one by one. Um, I'm asking Julia this, but as I say, I don't mind who answers it. Um, I asked um, Andrew to send me some information by email, as you know, and that information was the complex learning need pupil numbers between 2004 and 2013. For five schools, um, Foxfield, Meadowside, Ellery Park, Lindale, and Stanley. Now, going through them in this order, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just taking them one at a time. Foxfield in 2004 had 127, and they now last year had um, 124, so they've stayed relatively the same. Um, Meadowside, 78, 72. I'll skip to Stanley, 88, 10 years later, 89. Ellery Park, 50 in 2004. Last year they had 91, so they've almost doubled by 50%. Lindale was 40 in 2004, and now it's 24. So basically, Lindale's halved, and Ellery Park's doubled. Now, also looking at these fields, at these, this um, chart, each school takes children with PMLD. So why, when numbers are going down in Lindale, have children with PMLD be sent to, say, Ellen Park? <coughs> um, hasn't somebody been keeping an eye on this? Because it then, from what um, Emma Howlett, was it Emma? Um, yeah, I think it's Emma said that um, it's the council <coughs> statement and it's the council that refer to where a child goes to school. So why have the council allowed the numbers of Lindale to halve over 10 years? That's my first question. Okay, Councillor Fraser, I'll, I'll start, but colleagues may want to come into that answer. Um, the reason why uh, numbers that are what they are or changed over a period of time is parental choice. So I, I really looked into the, I really looked into the issue that parents have raised with me that there's been a, a subtext of diverting parents from one school to another. And I've asked colleagues, I've researched how the statementing process works and the response I've received when I've looked at our admissions booklets and there is a very clear process set out and over a period of time these are choices that parents have made as part of the overall statement in process um, at this point in time um, there is as you know there are three primary schools for children with complex learning difficulties stanley ellery park and lindale um, <coughs> About a year ago, um, an HMI, Her Majesty's Inspector, was commissioned by the local authority to look at where the children with profound and multiple learning difficulties were being educated. And they looked at the children who were being, there were some children with PMLD who were educated at Ellery Park School, and the, the larger number of children were at the Lindale School. And they formed the view that individual Eric Craven formed the view that both settings could appropriately care for children with profound and multiple learning difficulties. Stanley School has, has focused more on children on the autistic spectrum and currently don't have children with a profound and multiple learning difficulty. 
But the view was that the first Ellery Park at that point in Lindale could care for children with profound and complex needs. And it was parents making choices about where they, which school their child attended. And just to follow up with that, Emma did say that she was only offered one school and it wasn't Lindale. So you can't choose something if you don't know about it. If you're not told about a school, you can't have yeah, a yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just very briefly on that, um, the three